in, let me see. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen so that you guys can hopefully see it. Hold on one second. Can you all see that presentation? Okay, awesome. So <clears throat> I want this to be as um, conversational as possible. So if you guys have questions or thoughts or anything that y'all have been working on as a group, please uh, let me know so that we can talk about it. I hear Nikki says y'all are going to be talking about newsletters, which I think is great because that's something that a lot of reporters have been trying to figure out how to fit that into their uh, portfolios. And so if there's anything in terms of multimedia journalism, digital journalism that you guys and specifically are interested in yourselves, let me know so we can talk about it. Um, but I'll just start off giving a little background information on me. I am currently a freelancer, but before I went freelance, um, I'm an Atlanta native, so I'm he from here born and raised. I was a broadcast major and a film minor, uh, Georgia State University. I graduated in 2014. Um, and I knew at a pretty young age that I had an interest in entertainment. I always tell people I knew I wanted to be in the world of entertainment, but I realized pretty early on I didn't have the patience to be a manager. And um, I didn't have the talent to be an artist myself, <laughs> um, but I knew I really liked to write and I knew I had a real passion for telling stories. And <clears throat> so it was probably my junior or senior year of high school um, where I started a blog because my friends got tired of me talking to them about all the concerts I was going to. So I said, oh, I'll just write about them. I'm going anyway. And I figured out that I could email publicists and say, hey, I'm coming to this show. I have this many readers on my blog. You know, can I get a comp ticket? And sometimes they would say yes. And if they said no, I was just going to buy the ticket anyway. Um, and so I started writing um, about entertainment and music. And it wasn't until then, probably my senior year, freshman year of college that I thought, oh, I could maybe study journalism and do this as a career because I kind of like it. Um, and so in, I, I went to Georgia State and ended up majoring in, um, in broadcast. I wanted to be an on-air reporter, ended up not um, going into that. But I moved to Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, um, Pennsylvania after college. And I worked as a entertainment reporter there for about a year, a little over a year. Um, covering everything. I mean, it was entertainment, but it was entertainment for Central Pennsylvania. So I covered the farm show. I covered a lot of country music. I covered things that were considered entertainment for Central Pennsylvania. And I always tell people I was really grateful for that experience because coming from Atlanta, it was a big culture shock to me. And it opened my eyes up to the fact that Atlanta is not the only place in the world and everything in that every place is not like Atlanta. And so it made me a more well-rounded person and reporter, I like to think. Um, so about a year into my time at um, in central Pennsylvania, I um, applied for a job at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and ended up getting it and moving back home to work actually with Nikki as the digital entertainment um, reporter. I think a digital, digital arts entertainment arts and culture reporter was the title. Um, and I worked with, I think we started on the same exact day. So I started with Nikki um, and she was my editor for about a year and a half before I left to go freelance. So I've been a freelance reporter for four years now, as of this summer. Like Nikki said, I've written for a number of places, Billboard, Teen Vogue, The Hollywood Reporter, recently The New York Times. Um, and I always say that this time has given me an opportunity to branch out and do things that maybe I wouldn't have done if I was a traditional, just kind of digital arts and entertainment reporter on staff. I think the staff reporter gave me the foundation, um, but I've been able to get into doing some TV things and some, um, some I did some stuff for Complex has a, um, has a YouTube channel called First We Feast. And I was on their program talking about lemon pepper wings and, and Atlanta, the TV show and the kind of wing culture here in Atlanta. Um, so I've done some kind of broadcast work there. I recently did a podcast end of December, early January that was about um, the Senate runoffs here in Georgia. And uh, I want to make sure I'm opening the chat so I don't miss it. Oh God, lemon pepper wings. Um, yeah, so I recently did a podcast um, it was called Gaining Ground, the New Georgia. It was for Cricket Media and Tenderfoot. And we talked to organizers, locals, and politicians here, kind of leading up to the Senate runoffs to see, you know, Georgia flipped blue for the first time since 1992. What did that mean? And what would that look like if the Senate runoffs uh, had that same flip? 
Um, and it ended up winning two awards, which was really exciting because it was my first time hosting and writing a podcast. And off the back of that, I'm now working on my own podcast that I had been pitching prior to. It finally got picked up. And I'm really excited about that. Happy to talk to you all about what that process as a pot as creating, hosting, producing, editing a podcast has been like, if you guys have questions about that, maybe we can talk about it later. Um, and then I would say the only other big thing that I do as a freelancer is I do some consulting work. Um, and I've done kind of workshops for uh publications like the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I come in and I talk to their cultural reporters about digital journalism. And I currently work as the editor at large for Capital B, which is a new uh, publication that is launching its first local newsroom here in Atlanta. And their mission, which is something I think is really interesting for you guys and for the future of journalism, is to make uh, reporting more accessible to the communities that we're uh, claiming to want to serve. So how do we incorporate local communities and allow them to tell their own stories? How do we equip them to be their own reporters in their own communities, right? So they do what's called a community listening engagement sessions where they go into different parts of Atlanta. They talk to them. They say, what are the stories that you want to hear? What are things that you feel have not been covered? And then they actually pay some of the locals, maybe like a block captain or somebody who's very active in their community to uh, kind of go to maybe like a city council meeting and take notes so that their neighbors can get that information. And it's all about equipping people in the community to become, uh, to, to get the information themselves and to share it with their neighbors. And so that's a really exciting um, thing. And there's some other journalists in town that are doing similar work that I think would be exciting for us to talk about. So that's a little bit about me. I mean, I think I shared with you already some of the projects that I've worked on, but just um, as a, a synopsis, those are some of the projects that I've worked on. And I've also done some sponsored content for Netflix, Bloomberg, and some other um, companies as well. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about how my views of journalism have changed since I was in you guys' shoes when I was in college. I guess, what, six, seven years ago, um, and just what I've learned about it. And then I want to talk to y'all and kind of see the ways that y'all are thinking about journalism, too. But I would say the, the biggest thing for me is that when I was in journalism, or it was very binary, right? You're a broadcast major, you're learning about going on TV. You're a print major, you're learning about writing for print, and that's it, right? And it wasn't really presented to me as you can be a digital reporter who sometimes goes on television or sometimes does podcasting work. Or you could be a TV reporter who sometimes write inve writes investigative pieces for digital, you know, that these worlds can coexist and that they kind of should coexist, right? Like you, it's okay for you to tell stories in multiple mediums and to decide the medium based on the story, right? Sometimes stories present themselves better for television. Sometimes they present themselves better for online, sometimes maybe they're a better audio project. Um, and so I I think I wish when I was in you guys' shoes that the journalism school had taught us that things didn't have to be as binary because the one thing that I'm learning um, in, in my career is that um, it's really important to be open to trying new mediums as they come out. You have to meet readers where they are. So if readers are really interested in newsletters, maybe you should start a newsletter. You know what I mean? If readers are really on a new platform. If they're on TikTok, then maybe you should figure out how to make some accessible TikTok so that they can get the news instead of trying to get them to come to where you are. Um, so that's really the biggest thing that's changed for me um, since I graduated college and have been in journalism. Um, and then the more community center reporting thing that I was talking to you guys about. I was telling Nikki last night that I was in Detroit recently and I met with some other kind kind of publications that are doing this community-centered nonprofit model. Um, there are two here that I want to note for you guys that are based in Atlanta, and I think it would be interesting for you guys to look into just so you can understand the work that they're doing. One is Canopy Atlanta, and they're a new publication. I think they launched, um, they launched their first issue last year, 2020. And the issue was on the West End. So the same thing that I was telling you guys about, they did a community listening sessions in the West End, and then they equipped about four or five people and named them board members of this issue 
who were experts kind of in the community of West End and said, you know, you tell us what stories you want us to uh, to report on and you tell us what stories you want to hear and how we should be reporting on these stories for your community. So they did one, I think, on a farmer's market in the West End. They did another one on the West End Mall and kind of what it means to locals, another one on art in the West End. And then I think another one was on, um, it was a photo series on how students were engaging with digital learning um, during the pandemic in the West End. And I just worked on an issue with them for Forest Park, which will be their second issue, um, similar kind of method, but just going to Forest Park and seeing. So the issues in Forest Park for say, um, for the education story I worked on, it's a very transient neighborhood. So how do teachers uh, deal with the fact that a large percentage of the students that they start with at the beginning of the year might have moved to a different part of town in a different school district by the end of the year. So how do they contend with that? How do they contend with the fact that uh, one in two students are living in, um, they're dealing with house, houselessness. And so maybe they don't have a permanent residence. Um, they don't have food outside of the food that they get at school. So how do they contend with some of these issues? And how did the pandemic exacerbate some of these issues? Um, so that was Forest Park. And then I think the third issue that they're going to do is in Bankhead. So they'll go to Bankhead and kind of ask those same questions and cater their stories to that community. Another example of a nonprofit uh, journalism organization here outside of Capital B Atlanta, which is the one that I just started working with. So Canopy Atlanta, Capital B Atlanta. And then the third one is Atlanta Civic Circle. Um, and I'm mentioning these three to you guys because I think it's important for you all to see the various ways in which journalism can exist and to ask yourself, what kind of journalist do you want to be, right? What kind of stories do you want to tell? <clears throat> and what medium is important to you to be maybe your primary? That's not to say, again, that it's binary. You can work in other, in other realms, but to understand that there are traditional outlets like the AJC or the New York Times, but there are also these nonprofit media um, organizations that that pop up there are also you know places that you know do uh just more non-traditional things like podcasting or like um, I'm trying to think there's a lot of ones that are kind of catering to social media and make sure that their content um exists kind of in these very quick hit quick digestible pieces. They're still very thoroughly fact-checked and reported on, but they're more for people who are on the go and want to digest their news. And so I want you guys to understand the landscape so that you can better um, know what's out there and know what's available to you as students as you go into journalism. Um, what else? I, oh, another thing that I, um, and that, that plays into the more, being more willing to meet with readers where they are with utility pieces, right? So if a lot of your readers get their news from Instagram, right? How can you use, if you did a long investigative piece, is there a way that you can turn this piece into maybe a chart or a graph for Instagram that can be easily digestible, easily shareable, and something that maybe people who are not going to go to the website can still see and interact with and share? Um, I think that when you are willing to meet the readers where they are, you can create these utility pieces that are a lot more um, useful. And then the other thing is having a better understanding of the importance of potential pitfalls of utilizing social media, um, the importance and the potential pitfalls of utilizing social media as a journalist. So I would say one thing that is really important for me is I've used Twitter to get a lot of the jobs that I've gotten as a freelance reporter. So when the New York Times reached out to me to cover Donda a few weeks ago, it was because their pop culture music writer followed me on Twitter. The Teen Vogue work that I did for three years was because I saw the Teen Vogue editor tweeted that she was looking for reporters and I decided, oh, I'll email her and take a chance and see if I get it. Same with the Hollywood Reporter. Um, so Twitter and social media has been a huge, huge platform for me in terms of growing my readership, but also in terms of getting in front of editors that live in New York or LA that might not have otherwise known me, right? But you also have to be mindful of some of the potential pitfalls and you wanna make sure that you are still thoroughly vetting your 
stories, thoroughly fact checking and being a credible source, even though you're putting up something that, you know, is going up on Twitter and you're throwing it up as 100 and 280 characters or however many characters or whatever, just because it's shorter, just because it's on social media does not mean that you can lose the credibility that you worked hard to, uh, to get as a reporter. Does that make sense? And do you guys have any questions so far? I'm curious to know kind of what you guys are interested in when it comes to journalism and uh, kind of if there are any particular mediums that y'all are hoping to explore as students um, so that you can see, because this is the time to explore, right? Like if you think I might like podcasting, start a podcast or intern for a podcast company now so that you can say, oh, I do like this or mm, this didn't really hit the way I thought it would. So maybe I'll try something else. This is the time to explore and try those things. So I'm curious to know what you guys um, think you might be interested in and what you'd like to explore. Um, yeah, I had a quick question, actually. Yeah. Um, so I recently, um, well, yesterday, I just applied to the school newspaper. Um, and they actually have, like, different departments. They have, like, a social media department. They got, like, a, a staff writer department. Um, and I applied for, like, both of those positions because mm -hmm. um, I know I, I am interested in, like, audience development right now. And I'm trying to, like, like explore that, that space. So I guess my question is, like, what types of... Um, things do you do personally to like um, make sure that your readers are like always engaged with you, you know? That's a really good question. I think that's something that if you get, uh, you're able to do that for your school newspaper, you are really gonna have to ask yourself like each community, right, engages in a different way. And so the way out in which I engage with my community in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania was very different from the way I engage in my community at the AJC. Very different from the way that I engage in my community when I'm working with Teen Vogue, whose readership tends to be students or it tends to be young people, probably early to mid twenties at the oldest, right? And so I think if you were to get that role, one of the things that might be useful to you um, when you start out is meeting with some of the editors who have maybe already been there for a few semesters and asking them, like, if they have any metrics or any data on your readership, right? Like, you know, do we know what they're interested in? Do we know what types of stories they tend, like, what tends to do the best on our website? You know, what tends to get the most feedback when we put out issues? Um, what tends to you know, just get the most uh, shares and the most buzz on campus. And then asking, I don't know if you guys already have social media accounts and things like that, but looking at those metrics as well, looking at the comments. And if there are no comments, maybe working with the editors that are already there to strategize and say, okay, you've already seen maybe what doesn't work. Are, are there some things that you guys are open to trying to see if maybe that can get us more engagement? And I think this is, again, the time where you really want to be as open to exploring and trying new things as possible, right? That's what the student newspaper is for. That's what I did a lot of when I was on the student newspaper. Um, so be open to trying new things and be open to doing things in both traditional and in non-traditional ways, right? Um, you guys are young, you're catering to students. So maybe the ways in which the New York Times is, is catering to their audience, maybe that's not going to be the way that y'all cater to your audience, right, of young students who are here in Atlanta, Black men. Um, and so you want to make sure that uh, you are thinking about that. And uh, I would say that it, the big thing that I would do if I were you in that role is to start out by asking some questions about what their metrics, what their data has looked like. And if they don't have that, then maybe say, hey, I would like to come up with a plan where we can start to track some of this stuff because that'll help us to kind of know what works going forward. Because the work, one thing you don't want to do as a reporter is just be writing things and not checking in with your audience to see if they even care about it, right? You don't want to be writing all of these stories. They're not getting any views. They're not getting any engagement and nobody's reading them. You wanna be writing things that your audience cares about and that they're wanting to engage with. And the best way to know that you're doing that is to look at data and to look at metrics and to ask, to ask questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure, thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions or things that you guys are thinking about? And I'm, I'm plugging my laptop in, but I'm listening, I promise. Uh, actually, I have another question. Um, 
so I also um like last year I had an idea I wanted to start my own podcast but I never got around to it but like Mm -hmm. um how do you like yeah like structure your topic or like you know how do you like the the whole like setup of a podcast like like, what's, what's the whole process like So I can tell you guys the biggest thing to do when you guys are interested in something is to engage with it a lot, right? And so if you're interested in making a podcast, listen to a bunch of different podcasts and ask yourself, what do I like about this podcast? Like, don't go beyond the surface of, I like that podcast. It seemed really good and say, well, what made it good? Was it the interview? Did they ask good questions? Was the host really engaging? Did I like the way that they structured the episode, right? Really ask yourself if you're listening to a podcast and you like it or you don't like it, why is that? What went into making it really good or what went into making it something that you particularly didn't care for, right? And that'll help you when you're making your own project that's similar to that to say, all right, I really like that in these other three podcasts. So I think that's something I want to try, right? That seems to be engaging or effective in a podcast. So I would say to start off by listening to a bunch of different podcasts, because there are so many and there's so many styles, right? For some people, their podcast lends itself well to just having more conversational style, um, you know, kind of off the cuff conversations. Other podcasts are very scripted, right? Everything is kind of in a structure, in a place. And that works for some types of stories and for other types of stories and more conversational style works. And so in addition to listening to podcasts and asking yourself those questions, you wanna ask yourself, what kind of story am I trying to tell and what format will lend itself the best to that type of story, right? So if you're doing something that's weekly and you wanna just talk about the latest news in sports or pop culture or whatever it may be, that might lend itself to a more conversational style podcast where you just kind of have bullet points of things you want to talk about and maybe you and a co-host or whatever the format is, you guys just kind of talk and riff off each other. But if you're doing something where you're telling a story and you're interviewing multiple people to get the different angles of this story and all of the perspectives and things, that lends itself more to a more scripted podcast where you're going to want to really structure it and layer it and make sure that you're coming in as a host and giving context and all of these things. I would say I had no idea how complicated the process of making a podcast is, right? When you listen to podcasts and they're really good, it is so many layers in there that you're not even thinking of, right? And so for me, I have a team of five people, I think, that work with me as contractors on making the podcast. One is a producer, one is an editor, one is doing the scoring, one is doing the artwork, one is doing, you know, fact checking, because I want to make sure that things are still rigorously reported and things of that nature. Um, And you really have to make sure that all of these processes make sense. But again, when I say this is the time to practice these things and this is the time to try it, right? This is the time to really do that because like things I didn't know, or I guess I didn't think about, oh, when I'm writing a story, I don't have to do quote unquote tape logging where I log every single minute of every single thing. I'll transcribe it and, you know, pull the best quotes in context, but the tape logging process is not the same as it would be in podcasting. That's a lot of time and a lot of effort that I just I didn't think about because my brain was thinking in terms of writing, right? And making sure that either myself or somebody else, maybe a producer or the the editor has the capacity and the budget, quite frankly, to make those things happen. Um, And so when I say, if you want to start a podcast, do it now, because this is a time where you're not beholden to deadlines and constraints and all of these things. And maybe you have a friend who's good at editing, so they're willing to help you out. Or maybe you want to learn editing yourself so that you can have that skill. This is the time to really try those things out and to really do it. Because one, you can reach out to mentors like myself or maybe some other people that Nikki might know, and we'll be very happy to give you uh, feedback and answer questions and things like that in a way that Maybe a little later in your career, it'll be harder to get in touch with people in these ways. Um, And two, if you try something out and you're like, I don't really like it, no harm, no foul. Move on to the next thing, right? Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I had a question. Yeah, go for it. So you talked about a little bit of the ups and downs with freelance work. Mm -hmm. 
you believe it's better to do freelance work right as you graduate from college or hold off for a moment and dive into the organizations and build up experience? I think that is a personal decision. And I think you have to do what works best for you personally and financially. Freelance is, um, you know, you don't get a steady paycheck every two weeks like you do if you work for a staff paper. Um, And so maybe that lends itself easier to you when you are a student. And if maybe you are living on campus or you live with a parent or a family member, and so you don't have to worry about expenses being as high as they would be once you're an adult and you are, you know, out on your own kind of independently, um, maybe freelance is easier for you to get started on now. I always tell students, I think all students should be at least trying to freelance in some capacity. You don't have to be doing it full time and a bunch, but it's it's a great opportunity in addition to internships for you to get bylines and things before you graduate from college, right? And there's no reason, I think a lot of times students get in, uh, intimidated where they say, well, why would anybody hire me from this? You know, if you're a reporter for the student paper and you cover music in Atlanta for the student paper and you have an idea that would be good for the AJC or for Atlanta Magazine or for another publication, and you can email them and say, here's some similar clips that I've done for my student paper. And, you know, there's no reason if you have the skill set, if you can write and if you have the access that they wouldn't hire you for that, for that assignment. And I have students, I believe there was a young woman who it was, it was a young woman and a young man from Kennesaw State University that I spoke to a couple of years ago. And both of them were able to get bylines in Atlanta Magazine while they were in college. One of them went on from her byline in Atlanta, Atlanta Magazine to get an internship there over the summer. Um, I think it's a great jumping off point. And Nikki just said she's hired students to write for the AJC before too. Um, so I wouldn't let your uh, the fact that you're in college discourage you. I would go ahead and try to freelance now One, because you get the bylines, even if you want to go into being a staff reporter, uh, the minute you leave college, you still have some great bylines on your resume. But two, if you're thinking, hmm, I think I want to be a freelancer after college, you get a chance to see if you really like that freelance life before you graduate college, right? Do I really like this? Do I like, because I like to tell people freelance is about more than being a good writer and being a good reporter, right? You kind of got to be good at business. You got to know what payment terms are. You got to know, uh, you know, how to follow up if your invoice is late. How do I make sure I get my invoice on time next time? You guys are delayed in paying me. You know, you have to know how to read contracts. I want to make sure that I'm not giving up my intellectual property on this story. So how do I negotiate that? It's about business as much as it is about being a good freelancer and a good reporter. There are some people that have no interest in running a business and that's totally fine. But maybe that means being a staff reporter is, you know, better equipped for you. This is the time now, though, where you can try that out and you can see, oh, okay, I kind of like this freelance. I like the flexibility. I like the ability to be able to write for a lot of multiple different people. And I don't mind the business aspects of being a freelancer. Um, I think this is just a great time to try it. But I wouldn't say there's a time after college or once you've done staff reporting. I, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. I would just say it's a personal preference. Thank you. Absolutely. That's a binary question, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good one, though, because I think so many people think about that and so many people have interest in freelancing, but they don't know which comes first. You know, should I go and get a staff job first or should I go and be a freelancer first? I mean, I really do think it's a personal preference. A lot of my friends that are freelancers, quite frankly, are freelancers because they couldn't get a staff job when they graduated and they freelance and said, I'll freelance until. The staff job comes along and then they really liked freelance and they stopped applying for staff jobs or they really didn't like it. So they kept applying until they got a staff job. You know, it it just depends for people. Um, But I do think that now is a really, really great time for you guys to be um, partnering with some of the local organizations here and pitching to them, getting in the habit of pitching. One of the things I tell Nikki all the time is I didn't know how to pitch as a freelancer when I was at the AJC because I didn't have to ask Nikki half the time when I was writing a story, I owned my beat. So when I wanted to write a story, I just wrote it. And if I needed to run it by Nikki, I walked over to her desk and said, Nikki, what do you think about this? And she'd be like, okay, or no. And then I'd move on. But there was no formal, I need to craft an email selling not only this pitch, but myself to you process, right? If I am pitching, I remember 
the first time I pitched an editor at Billboard. They lived in New York. I had never met them a day in my life. They didn't know me. They didn't know anybody that I knew. And I needed to not only convince them that my story was a good idea, but that I was the person that they should hire to write this story. That is a completely different skill set and process than just walking up to an editor that you already have a relationship with and saying, hey, Nikki, can I cover this? And I think that's something that even staff reporters can build and, and, and benefit from is having that formal knowledge of how to formally pitch somebody. Um, and so I think that's a good skill set that you guys can be practicing by pitching uh, local publications as freelancers now. Any other questions? So I wrote down some things about how to stand out for a digital journalism job. And there's a reporter, his name, his real name is Jamal Jordan, but his Twitter is at Lost Black Boy, Lil Uzi Hurt, which is funny because people always think he's really Lil Uzi. Um, but he tweeted recently and he was like, if I was developing a journalism job, some of the classes I require are. And I thought this was really good because it's a reminder that even though y'all are studying journalism, take other classes too that are that could be supplementary to your journalism class. So he suggested like an econ 101, statistics, uh, world history, zoning and urban planning, or like we said, life skills, taxes, LLC, freelance and negotiation, right? All of those things. And maybe a fine art elective, right? These are all things that are maybe not in a traditional journalism class, but are really good skills that you need to have as a reporter. So for me, I remember when I was studying journalism, I knew that I wanted to be in broadcast and I wanted to know how to edit. And I didn't feel like my school had, I didn't feel like their broadcast track taught me the things that I needed to do to be a one man band when I graduated journalism. So I said, well, what if I minor in film, right? Cause I minor in film. I'll learn about film, but I'll also get some hands-on editing experience that I can maybe transfer to my job as a journalist. So if you feel like there is something that you specifically need for your path, because all of us have different paths, for your path as a journalist that maybe you aren't getting from your, you know, the specific journalism track that you're taking, look and see what other courses and other tracks are offering and see how you can use that to supplement what you're learning in your traditional journalism classes. Um, and then another thing he said was, um, he was saying staff reporters often develop a tunnel vision around their ca uh, craft. Um, if you work at a company with extremely talented photo, audio, and video makers, you're not necessarily taking your own pictures or doing your own video. You have somebody that can do that for you but it's a really good skill to have, right? And so challenge yourself again while you're students. If you're doing an interview of somebody, maybe take the photos or try to do some portraits of them, or maybe take a video and see if you can have a video component to go along with your story. If you're a staff reporter, that might not be your only job, you know, once you get into the actual journalism field, but it's just a really good skill to have. And if, you know, maybe all of the staff photographers are busy that day, you're not lacking out because you can take your own pictures. Or if you can't have a videographer with you for this story, all right, no worries. I'll take my, my iPhone and I'll shoot my own video, right? Like you already know the skills. Um, so just ask yourself, you know, what journalism projects can you be working on as a student reporter? Like we talked about, what else can you study outside of traditional journalism that will make you better skilled at your beat, right? Another thing we talked about. Um, and what audiences do you innately understand and how can you position yourself as an asset to editors? So that's what we were talking about earlier when we talked about, you know, if you're doing audience development for your school paper, you innately understand students at Morehouse. You are a student at Morehouse. You engage with this community all the time, right? And so you innately understand this audience. How can you be an asset to the student newspaper? Or if you are assigned a story for the AJC, writing about a story at Morehouse, you know, what context and understanding of campus do you have that you can bring to that story and to editors? So as you're working on stories, even as a student, ask yourself, you know, if you're from Virginia and you have a real understanding of Virginia, or, you know, if the story is about Virginia, maybe you pull on that knowledge. If you're from Atlanta, same things. What audiences and stories do you innately know that you can really get in and sink your teeth into um, and prove that you're an expert in these topics? And then the fourth thing is what roles can have a basic um, understanding 
what roles can having a basic understanding of photo, video, and audio journalism unlock? So same thing that we talked about earlier, right? Um, if you have an understanding of all of these different platforms, how can you be a better reporter? Um, so those are really, I would say, four of the things that are really important and I really want you guys to think about. And then I wanted to leave you guys with um, some of my favorite reporters who write in the digital space or do other things uh, in terms of multimedia journalism that I think is really uh, worthwhile for you to pay attention to. One of them is a Morehouse alum, Brandon Jinx Jenkins. Um, he is a reporter. I think he started out working for Complex, if I'm not mistaken. But I put him on here because he recently uh, serves as a host of a podcast called Mogul. They just did a series on um, DJ Screw from Houston. And it was a series about um, his life and his legacy and then his subsequent death um, from a codeine overdose. Really, really phenomenal podcast. I would encourage you guys to listen to it. Um, and he's an example of somebody who has written both print stories, digital stories, cover stories for magazines, but also done podcasting, also done some video work. I think he's done a lot of video interviews for Complex's channels. Um, Angelica Bastian, she is the film and TV culture critic for Vulture, phenomenal, really great reporter. I would suggest reading her. Darian Simone Harvin, she is really great um, for when you guys talk about newsletters. She started a Substack probably last year because she saw that maybe there weren't a lot of publications that were covering beauty space as it related to Black women um, in a way that she thought was useful. And so she started a newsletter to one, compile all of the stories that she saw about this, but to two, write some of the stories that weren't getting accepted by traditional publications so that they could still be told. Um, so I would highly suggest her because She's really somebody, when we think about thinking of alternative um, avenues, right, she's able to get subscribers to pay for her subscription for her newsletter. So that is a stream of income for her as a reporter. Um, Justin Tinsley is another one. He works for The Undefeated, which is an ESPN publication. He just did a, he just did a podcast for their 30 for 30 series on Nipsey Hussle, um, but he also writes as a reporter for The Undefeated digital website. Um, Rodney Carmichael, an Atlanta-based reporter. He started off at Creative Loafing. Um, he now works for NPR Music and does uh, writing on hip hop for them, but also just came out with a absolutely phenomenal podcast called Louder Than a Riot that takes a look at the connection uh, between hip hop and mass incarceration. Um, phenomenal podcast. And again, somebody who's based here in Atlanta. So somebody certainly worth knowing. And if you have interest in some of those topics, maybe even reaching out to. Um, and then Harry Lyles Jr. is the last one, Georgia State University alum. Um, he got started at SB Nation, which was a digital publication through Vox Media. And he now just got promoted in the last two weeks to be a um, college football reporter on air for ESPN. So he started out doing kind of um, semi-regular packages for them. And now he's on uh, every week doing some of their college football reports. Um, so again, an example of somebody who started out in the digital writing space and has kind of progressed into TV. So these are a few people that I think are really, really good at what they do and a really great example of how to be a multimedia reporter um, in today's time that I think you guys should be paying attention to. Do you guys have any? Uh, yeah, we, Nikki, what did y'all talk about Vox for? Because I think Vox is a really good example of Actually, we talked about Vox uh, in a couple of different capacities. Number one, it that they used um, audience development and from a digital standpoint to create their content. Mm -hmm. and they also started their content with questions, right? So we reviewed the series. So uh, glad you asked, but the whole premise of the series is they start off with one question, does my neighborhood determine my future? And then they attempt to answer that question through a series of interviews and research. So that was one, and then we also looked at Vox in a way that talked about brevity. And so if you guys remember during the um, class, we said part of brevity is to or organize the content and break it up and make it scannable. And Vox does an incredible job of just their presentation, their audience development, asking questions. And then it is a digital, it is a, digi a digital um, media outlet. Yeah, and they, I have a good friend who does, who who previously did their SEO analytics and really helped them, like you said, with that audience development when it comes to 
how does the metrics and the data of what our readers are interested in help determine the ways in which we're telling our stories, right? Um, and how do we use that to figure out what's working on our site, what's not working on our site? Um, it's really, really interesting and something that um, I think is extremely important. So yeah, I'm glad you guys were able to talk about that audience development um, portion. Okay. I don't know if there's anything that I haven't touched on that you guys think is really important. Any questions y'all have about my path as a digital reporter and multimedia journalist um, that you might want to talk through or any hesitations you guys have about your future paths or anything like that, I'm happy to answer questions and be a resource to y'all. Um, so let me know if there's anything I haven't touched on. Yeah, I, I have another question. Um, so one thing that I kind of struggle with as a writer in general, I have like, uh, like um, what's it called? Uh, writer's block, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so like, what are some strategies that you might have to like overcome like when you're like stuck and you're trying to like create something but you, you can't really, you know, figure it out? One thing that I would say has been really helpful for me for helpful for me as a reporter is I always ask myself, why do I have writer's block, right? Sometimes is that I need to get more information. Sometimes is that I need to do more reporting, right? If I, because a lot of times once I've gotten everything and I have all the pieces, I'm very visual. So I can almost envision the way the story is going to unfold and what the outline is going to look like. And if I'm having trouble getting that vision, maybe I don't have all the pieces. Do I need to go and talk to some more people? Do I need to go and ask some more questions, right? Um, so that's something that's really important to ask yourself. Are there some holes here? You know, are there some gaps that I could feel that would maybe help this kind of come together more? And maybe that's why I'm having writer's block or procrastinating. But then the second thing is I figured out that I write better at different times of the day, right? And so I structure my day like that. And even as a staff reporter, I think you can do this to some degree, right? I tend to write better in the morning. So usually if I have a story due, I'll schedule on my calendar a writing block from eight to 10 or eight to 12 or whatever it may be. So that in the mornings, I know I'm blocking off my time because that's when my head is the clearest and that's when I can get my writing done. I will do interviews and answer emails and do all of that stuff that I need to do um, at the end of the day during the afternoon, right? And so maybe you write better in the afternoon. So in the morning times, you wanna answer emails and schedule your interviews and do your transcribing. Um, and then in the afternoons, you have a writing block schedule. Whatever it is for you, maybe that'll be helpful to block off that time. And even if you're not, even if you're just kind of writing out thoughts and even if it's not coherent, just push yourself to get something on the page. Um, and I think having those formal blocks and knowing what parts of the day I tend to write better has helped me to better structure my days to be more productive. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Excellent answer. I, I just taken notes. <laughs> um, I do want to say also how I get past writer's block. I don't I don't feel like I even deal with writer's block much anymore because to kind of uh, take what Jewel said about being a visual person, I mentioned in the class the other day, I like to outline things a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if I figure out, okay, this is the topic. And then I think what I want to talk about in this topic. Okay, who do I want to reach out to in this topic? And which what holes do I need to fill? It, it comes a lot easier when you plan, basically. Yeah, and then you can really, when that out with that outline, right, you can see for yourself, okay, I know I want to touch on this, but I don't really think I have somebody that's spoken to that well yet. So that might be the missing piece. I want to go back and talk to this person. Or maybe it's not talking to somebody else. Maybe it's just doing some more research. And, you know, maybe I, let me see if I can find some data or some other reporting that can supplement my reporting on this topic, right? Like if you have an outline, you can more easily kind of fill in those gaps. Bingo. Also, I find writer's block comes when you don't understand something. Like you can't, mm -hmm. you can't really explain it because you don't understand it. Yes, you gotta do more research. You gotta do more reporting. You gotta talk to more people. Mm -hmm. Got you. Okay. Nikki, did you have any questions or anything that I haven't touched on that you wanna make sure I talk about? I actually have one question. So. You're mo I consider you very um, layered in your career. Is it, and this is a binary question, you guys, but <laughs> is there a specific type of medium that you like more than the others that you feel that you're, that you're drawn to, or do you feel you get something different out of all of them? I really feel I get something different out of all of them. I mean, I, I think 
for the rest of the year, I'll be hunkered down working on this podcast. That'll be a, a major part of my days for the rest of, you know, through December. Um, and I, I hope that I will be able to do more podcasting in the future. I want that to be a huge chunk of my career and what I do. I want to eventually get into documentaries and doing things of that nature, but I'll always be a writer. I'll always be writing. Maybe I won't put out four or five stories a week. Maybe it'll be one story a month or, you know, what have you, it'll be less frequent. Maybe I'll only write, you know, bigger features or bigger profiles or things like that. But I think I'll always be a writer. Um, I don't think I have a favorite. I think it varies. I think it depends on the story that I want to tell. I think it depends on kind of my interests at the moment. Um, and again, it depends on what the audience is interested in, right? Like, I don't want to tell a story in podcast format that my audience don't listen to podcasts. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I think just being open to different things. But I I really enjoyed this time in journalism because I do get to be open and I do get to try a lot of different mediums and I don't have to pick one, you know? I love it. And then another question I have is writing. So we've been studying about what makes good writing. Now, obviously I'm gonna come from my perspective and share, but I think that can vary per writer, per journalist. What would you say makes good writing? Mm. I think it has to be something that's compelling that at the heart of it, we're talking about humans. So you have to get to that human aspect about why, why should people, why should somebody care about your story? There's so many stories that get published every single day. What about this story is important that somebody should take time out of their day and read it? Even if it's a short story, why should they take those few minutes out of their day to read your stories you know why do why should people yes why should people care and I think if you're getting to the heart of that a lot of times it's human it's the human element of it right like if you're writing an education story about Forest Park the reason that people should care is because perhaps the Forest Park locals that are reading it have students who go there and they want to make sure that the school system is the best that it can be for their kids you know they deserve equitable learning they deserve to have, you know, diversity in their school system. They deserve for their kids to be um, cared for and for them to have the resources that they need. That's why they care, right? And so your story should touch on that. It should really hit at that point. Um, I think that's what makes good compelling writing um, is when you can, you know, the the uh, old, old uh, adage of show, don't tell, you know, when you're really showing people why this story matters, right? Instead of telling them, this matters, you should read it, show them show them why this story is important. And even if it's something that, you know, I have a friend I always say, she has the craziest ideas, but then you read them and you're almost mad. Like, why didn't I think about that, right? She wrote a story a few years ago about <laughs> how people, when they go to national parks, they have to go to the bathroom and they don't always dispose of it in the best way. And how that was becoming a problem for national parks because it was polluting the national parks. I would have never thought about poop in national parks. That just was not mm -hmm. going to cross my mind, mm -hmm. but it's such an important story. And she wrote it in a way that was so engaging and so interesting that it, you almost go, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, duh, that makes sense. She's really good at that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what makes good writing. I wouldn't have thought of that. I mean, I need to go to national parks. I'm in the mall. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have thought about it, but when you read it, you go, oh, that matters. That's right. <laughs> and like, don't pollute our environment. I mean, we all care about yeah. the environment. So like, yeah, yeah. Um, really interesting story. And I think she got it. Like I said, what are some things that you innately know? She <laughs> goes to national parks a lot. She encountered this and thought, I wonder if this is a bigger problem than I realized. Let me investigate. Let me look into it. And she was able to build a story around that. Right. Beautiful. Those are what makes stories interesting. I think when we're interested in topics and we don't always get to write about stuff that we're interested in, that's part of the job. But when you're interested in topics, you ask better questions, you're more engaged and it comes through in your writing. Yeah. Asking, that curiosity. At curiosity, asking questions. We, we've had these conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask one more question and I'll, I'll leave it to everyone else if they would like to ask more uh, before we end. But uh, you mentioned some of the journalists, which I'm recording this session, so I'll share this with folks. But you mentioned some of the journalists that perhaps we should be paying attention to. What were, besides the traditional outlets, besides the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, what 
type of um, what what outlets would you say that we should be paying attention to that maybe it's not on our radar? That's a really good question. I think that the reason that I mentioned Darian, because she's a really good example of somebody who's like writing on Substack, but doing really substantial reporting and doing really interesting. Um, thank you, Natasha. Um, really interesting work on a non-traditional platform. The way that I think about it might be a little less traditional than some people, but I follow reporters more than I follow publications, right? Like, so if I know a report, there's a reporter, her name is Amanda Mole. She went to UGA. She writes for the Atlantic. And every single piece she does like trend pieces, but they're so good. And every single piece that she writes, it just makes me go, I would have never thought about that. Or I didn't even know I had an interest in this topic, but she wrote it in a way that was really engaging. And she explained why it mattered to me, even though I didn't think it did, right? And so I followed her. And whenever she tweets that she wrote a story, I'm going to read it because she's just a really good writer, right? And if she leaves and she goes somewhere else that's not the Atlantic, I'm probably going to follow her there and read her work there too. Taylor, um, what is Taylor's last name? I can't remember her last name, but she is the, she's the um, influencer reporter for the New York Times. Taylor, Taylor Lorenz, phenomenal reporter. She started at the Daily Beast. Now she's at the New York Times. Um, she's doing, she's on a book break now because she's writing a book. Phenomenal influencer reporter. She writes about teen culture and influencer culture. Wherever she goes, I'm gonna follow her. If she on TV, I'm gonna watch it. If she doing a podcast, I'm gonna listen. You know what I mean? And so I try to follow people who write compelling stories or tell compelling stories more than the publications themselves. Um, that's been my strategy. That's really worked for me. Um, but yeah, that's my that's my answer to that. Okay. What other questions do you all have? Honestly, I was going to ask if I could just like have, have your email so I can just like ask you more questions later on. Of course, I will give you guys my email address and you can email me if any you have any questions. I always try to respond to students. It might not be that day. It might not be that week, but I promise I will respond. Um, I'm happy to help and answer questions. And then I will also say um, I am an internship. I put it in the chat, but I'm an internship coordinator for the Atlanta Press Club. I'm a board member there and we do internships every summer with the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Atlanta Magazine, GPB. Um, I think we did Atlanta Civic Circle this year, which was the, one of the nonprofit organizations that I was telling you about. Um, I started there as an intern. I actually, before I got a job at the AJC or in Pennsylvania, I interned through that program for Atlanta Magazine. Um, and I have a few other students who have done so as well. I would really encourage you guys to apply. They play a stipend. Um, for students over the summer to do that work. And um, so if you think you want to apply, let me know because I'm happy to give you feedback or let you know um, to look over your resume or to kind of give you feedback and let you know what we're looking for um, so that you can present, put your best foot forward and, and make sure that you're a strong candidate. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jewel. Did you have other questions? Did anyone have other questions? Okay, just meant, I want to make. You think sure. of it, if you guys think of anything um, after the course, like I said, just sh shoot me a message. But I hope that this was helpful. It was more than helpful. You see my notes, Jewel, like right here. <laughs> very, I very. I so I hope that you all feel very full and fulfilled, and that you felt like you learned something or you had a good conversation. I certainly felt like I did. And I want to thank you, Jewel, for your time and your knowledge and you being so free and sharing it. And you guys, this is Jewel. That's just naturally how she is. She's fun. She's sharing. She's just a very kind person. So I hope you get a chance to reach out to her and get to know her a little bit better, um, as I've been lucky to do. So I'm going to, yeah. Um, did you have any last words, Jewel? No, I was just going to say, y'all, I really encourage y'all to take advantage of Nikki while she is y'all's uh, professor, because she is always willing to help and has been nothing but supportive to me even after I left her at the AJC. <laughs> I'm going freelance. Yeah, like, no, you're not. Me. You She's like, no, you're not. And I was like, yes, I am. Oh, and I, I always tell the story of, I remember when I was, I interviewed Janelle Monet for the Recording Academy and Nikki was in the front row taking pictures and videos and just super supportive and always willing to answer questions or be a resource. And I know that she would be that same way to y'all. So Please take advantage of that. Even when this course is over, keep in touch with her. 
and make sure that you are making connections now when you're in college because the connections that I made in college that's how I got my job at the AJC you know those these connections really matter and it might not you might not get a job right out of college from this person but you never know five years from now they might be looking for somebody with your skill set and they go oh I remember Derek, let me reach out or let me recommend him. So you really want to make sure that you're keeping in touch with the people that have an impact on you. Oh, that's good. And thank you for that. And I'm still heartbroken you left me. <laughs> but I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a good rest of your class. Right. Goodbye, everybody. I'll send the recording later. Thank you. Bye. Right. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Uh -huh.